Our wounds are not out to harm us. Our wounds are out to be healed. They're going to tug at us. They want our attention because the pain from the past wants to be resolved. But if we don't resolve it, it's going to keep finding ways to poke its little head up. It'll crash and burn the stuff around you if you don't tend to it. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Mark Groves podcast. Today I have world-renowned marriage and family oh, therapist, boy. Vienna Farron. Welcome. Thank you. I know it took so much out of you to hold back from saying Vienna Faroon. It did. I had to learn lovingly to <laughs> pronounce your name properly. For context, everybody, we are also best friends, so that helps mm. uh, in the dialogue. And um, Vienna has been one of my greatest teachers. So I'm so excited to have you back on the podcast because you were like one of the OG guests, I think in the first 10 that I did. So welcome back. I think that I was the first episode. You would have been the second because I was the first, but yes, you, you might've actually been. Yeah. I am pretty sure you can go back to the books to to check it and, and <laughs> yeah. we can confirm for the people. But I'm pretty sure that I was the first and how far you have come oh on this God. podcast uh, and, and interviewing. So I'm excited to be back. Thank you for having me. Always fun to jam with you. Yeah, we've increased the quality of audio and the quality of video. We never had video <laughs> at the time. We have a couple mics that aren't from Amazon anymore, you know. Um, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm so excited to have you back. And, you know, I'll never forget that at the beginning of our uh, blooming friendship that I said to you, you were like, oh, how was your childhood? Which, of course, you'll learn is is really uh, is such a core question for Vienna. And I was like, oh, it's great. <laughs> you know, it's such a great family and da, da, da. And she's like, are you sure there's not anything in there? And I was like, nah, there's nothing to look at. Like, we're all good. And, you know, just the recognition of through learning from you, through, through learning from other marriage and family therapists and systems-oriented people, just how afraid I was to that I've, if I found a flaw in my family or in my childhood or in my parents' parenting, that it somehow made them not wonderful or, or great people anymore. And that was a hard, uh, learning how to hold that paradox was interesting. So maybe we could start there of just like, what got you so in, because that, that really opened my world to so many understandings that I wasn't really willing or able to see before. So what got you so obsessed and curious and, and all of that about uh, childhood and family systems? It's funny that you share that story. Um, mine is a little bit different than yours, but when I first started grad school, I entered into that space saying that my parents' divorce didn't affect me mm. at all. And so in some ways, I think like we became <laughs> such good friends. It's like, I see myself in you. <laughs> I know, I know this, I know this person. Um, you know, I too had existed in life for a really long time, uh, believing or convincing myself that I was okay, that I had a pretty good childhood and there really wasn't anything from the past that was affecting me. And what I learned was that actually making space to be affected would then require me to feel mm. and feeling felt really scary to me. Right? I had for a long time been someone who presented as I'm fine. Everything is okay. Everything is good. I'm unaffected by everything. Nothing bothers me at all. That's, that's the woman that I had presented as for a really long time. And when I started to come into contact with the idea that like, Ooh, maybe my parents' divorce did affect me. Right? There was such a big confrontation there for me because it would require me to get pretty intimate with my emotions, my feelings, uh, and how hard it actually was. And I had really structured and organized my life around pretending like it wasn't. That brings us back to when I was a tiny little human in this world, my parents uh, got separated when I was in first grade. They went through a nine-year divorce process on top of the separation process. Um, people by now, I think, know it was the longest in the state of New Jersey at the time. And I watched a tremendous amount of 
conflict, a lot of psychological abuse, a lot of manipulation, gaslighting, paranoia, emotional flooding, just it was wild, really, really wild. Police were around a lot, you know, it was just, there was a lot of intensity uh, it, during those years. And I had taken on this role. Um, I'm an only child. Um, I always share that. I think it's important to know that I didn't have any other little humans around me at that time. Um, I was in this experience really on my own. Uh, no one to be like, oh my gosh, did you see what they, like, can you believe what they did? Like there was no space to really talk about and validate and really co-witness what was going on. And neither of my parents repartnered or remarried either. And so I also didn't have any other adults in this space who could be a grounding, calming force for me. So as a child, you know, I always say my parents were, you know, it was crashing and burning. The system was crashing and burning. The system I called my family was crashing and burning around me. And, you know, I think they did everything they could to protect me as much from it as possible. But I still heard it, saw it, felt it, experienced it, witnessed it. And it did a number. I became a kid who tried to fly under the radar. I really wanted to make sure that I didn't add to the crashing and burning. I thought that it would be the thing that broke the camel's back. The camel's back was certainly already broken, <laughs> yeah. but I was like, I cannot add more yeah. to this. And so I learned how to, yeah, operate under the radar. I learned to present as if I was totally fine, super well adjusted. Um, I was really good at acting the part. You know, even to this day, they could sometimes be like, but you were such a well adjusted <laughs> child. And I'm like, I know. I did a really good job a convincing actress. you guys of this. Yeah, I was a really great actress. And and so, yeah, I became this needless little girl. You know, my core needs were absolutely met, certainly, but I my emotional needs were not. And I got good at anything I put my mind to. That was a really easy kind of coping strategy for me. And it was also my contribution to trying to help the system get by, right? If I don't add any more stress to this already crashing and burning system around me, then I'm doing my part, right? Then I'm helping out in some way. But in that, I really got erased, you know, mm -hmm. in that I was not seen, in that I had zero needs of my own that I could express, or probably more important to say it this way, they were not able to be attuned to what I was actually experiencing or needing at that time. It wasn't my responsibility to bring that forward. Fast forward, and you're a big part of this story, but fast forward, I'm an adult. I'm an adult, a needless woman who continues to pretend like everything is fine. I'm unaffected by things. I have zero boundaries. I'm cool down for whatever, right? I presented as the, the sort of the cool girl persona. And there was a moment in my, uh, in, a, in an adult romantic relationship where someone I was dating, someone I thought was, uh, you know, I could see a future with, uh, his ex came back into the picture and, um, we were, we were together at the time and he was considering going back to, into this relationship and I made space for him. Uh, I was like, of course I understand this must be so hard, you know, just fully focusing on just, you know, I think being a therapist doesn't help with this, right? Where you're like, <laughs> right. I get the, yeah. I know that there's a story here. Of course there's layers. Um, it's multifaceted, but I was putting any of my feelings, any of my boundaries aside, any of my needs, they were all so far off in the distance. And I remember, remember having a conversation with you. I don't know if you remember this. Um, and it clicked in and I was like, Oh my gosh, I am literally in the same role yeah. that I was as a little girl. And listen, this, this happened years into, you know, being a marriage and family therapist and my training and all of that. Um, 
But I remember this like shocking moment. And, it, and this is true. I think anybody listening totally gets this, that like sometimes the simplest of things are truly the most profound moments in our lives, so right? True. Where you look back and you're like, how did I not know this? How did I not see this? How is this? How is that so hidden to me for so many years? Right? It's like, I've been there. I get it. And we have to be gentle with ourselves in this exploration because when it clicks in, wow, yeah. do things change? And yeah, I remember having that conversation with you and just being like, oh man, this is what I've been doing my entire life. And I called him uh, afterwards and my heart was racing and my palms were sweating and I was so nervous. And this is the first time I was ending a relationship with someone. That's not so surprising because it's really hard to end relationships when you're telling people you're fine all the time. (laughs) You know, to be like, well, what's the problem? But this was the (laughs) first time I was ending a relationship and I finally got to say, what's going on is actually not okay with me. I'm actually really affected by the fact that you're spending so much time with this person. It feels dishonorable to the relationship that we have. And, you know, there were, there were other things said in there, but ultimately like, I'm, I'm going to exit from this as you figure out, you know, what you want. And it was the last time that we spoke and it was the first time that I had carved a new path for myself. I think about cross country skiing. If anybody's done it and you're on the tracks, it's easier to go. It's familiar, right? The the track is already there. And I talk about this moment as jumping off of those tracks into fresh powder, never been, you know, traversed before and how much harder it is certainly, but that once you do it, right, you're like, okay, I survived that. I'm still here. I said the thing, I did the thing. I'm, I'm still existing this is a hard pivot for me to make, but I am on the path to changing the way that I operate in this. You know, my husband very well. He loves to joke about the fact that he never knew that woman and that I have somehow turned into this person who absolutely has no problem expressing what her needs are, how she's feeling and uh, what she does or doesn't like. So I clearly didn't turn back from there. But the whole point of this is to say, you know, I, you know, our families, of course, we've all heard this many times before, are really the first uh, education we get in just about everything. And I did not have a great education, to say the least. Um, there were so many beautiful things that they offered me 100%. But I didn't have a great example and model and template for love and relationships and communication and conflict and boundaries and, 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 and. And I was really scared for a period of time to find myself in a relationship like the one that my parents had. And so, you know, from a really unevolved kind of fear-based place, I was like, I need to go to school to get this education truly. And, you know, I did that of course, and there was so much that I learned. Um, but then from there, it was like, I really need to tune into the unresolved pain from my past because that irresolution comes forward into our adult relationships, just our lives, our friendships, work, everything. It touches everything if we don't resolve it. There's been so many examples of how you know an unwanted pattern in my life currently is always linked to something unresolved from the past. And, you know, I wanted to be in functional, healthy relationships that mattered to me. I wanted to understand what made functional and healthy relationships happen and what was the difference between those and the ones that end in the way that my parents did. So, you know, I entered onto this, into this journey, onto this path, um, but it just continued and continued from there, really seeing how important it is to understand the pain from the past and how it shows up present day. Sometimes it's obvious, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, clear as day. And other times it shows up in really subtle ways that we know very little about. So if we can spend you know, some intentional time really knowing kind of how to look and where to look, um, we can start to resolve that which is unresolved. It's interesting to think that the patterns that we exist in or find ourselves in today to explore the pathology being in childhood. And why do you think we have such a resistance to you know, I said that my resistance now I see unconsciously was to sort of dethrone my parents and then have to deal with the ways that my needs weren't met and and humanize them in doing that. 
but I'm curious, what, what do you see as the resistance that we often have? Yeah, right. That's, that's a really common one is that we've idealized in some way, uh, what the story is and it can feel like some type of a betrayal to them or that we're ungrateful. And, you know, a lot of times people don't want to feel that way. You often hear people say, you know, they did the best that they could with what they had, what they knew, or they sacrificed so much. They Mm -hmm. gave up everything for me. And I think it's important to hear that it doesn't always have to come from this malicious place, Mm -hmm. right? Origin wounds that they talk about in the book, right? Origin wounds can come from people doing the absolute best that they possibly can, but we're still left feeling a certain way. I talk about uh, one client in the book whose mom worked multiple jobs, double shifts most days. The only time you really got with her was on Sunday mornings where they'd go to church and have brunch afterwards. And then she'd go off to his next shift. And he has so much love for his mom and saw the sacrifice and held her in such high regard. But it didn't change the fact that he wanted more time Mm -hmm. with her. You know, it didn't change the fact that he still wanted to be the priority, even though he could rationalize, like she's working so hard. She is, she's doing all of the things to show me that I am important to her. That was all true, right? But it still left him wanting more of her, right? And I think that's important to realize that this doesn't have to come from our parents always being negligent, always being selfish, always being X, Y, and Z, right? Sometimes, um, the wounds will come from normal circumstances, Mm -hmm. right? Just circumstances that we can't avoid. But going back to your question, yeah, the idealization of it. I think a lot of times, you know, clients often will present in therapy where they are really focused on what's happening in their lives right now. They're coming in to solve a problem. They want to figure this out. They want to talk about how to improve communication. They want to move through a particular conflict that has presented in the last couple of months. And so they're really focused on the here and now. So the idea of having a journey backwards, people are like, why? I want to solve this right now. Can we just <laughs> Do, talk about this? Can we just not the go there? Like, just... Yeah. Can we just not go there? Right. So a lot of times it feels like it's um like we're going down oh, the wrong like path. Like it's not productive or going backwards. It's not yeah. productive. We're going backwards. Of course, there's the fear of finding things that we're afraid of finding. Yeah. That right? exists regardless of whether you look at them or not. And I think that's an, a strange thing of the human psyche. Then we can't work with the material. That's right. Right. And so, you know, there's a lot of wanting to preserve the image. There's a lot of fear of what I'm going to find. There's concern of it changing the relationship that you do have today, right? Like if I do come into contact with this, how will I be able to relate to you today? And will that change that? And I'm scared of that happening. So yeah, there's a number of things we can come at it from a protective place of protecting others, protecting ourselves or protecting both. And, you know, I mean, that again, that's the gentleness of it is that, okay, here's this protective mechanism. Who are you trying to protect and why? What are you afraid of coming into contact with? Um, But the beauty of this work is that you can go at a pace that feels okay for you. And I think I do a really nice job in the book, really holding the reader, the listener's hand as we dive into this. You know, it's, it is hard stuff. Um, This is usually not, you know, people don't, I guess you can get to a point where you do, but usually when you're starting off in this work, you know, it's like, there's a little bit of hesitancy and, you know, you're just a little protective of what it is that you might find and also how it might change the way that you view your childhood too. Yeah. And in, in a way, I think what has been so, because you've been such a guide for me in this exploration and I do have an advanced copy of said book and you do (laughs) what, just like you do in life, you are able to gently invite people into a place that's filled with, you know, feels like immense complexity or fear of facing something. And I think you do such a beautiful job of gently inviting people in that space so that their capacity can hold it chapter by chapter, which is, I mean, it's a gift that you have. And so I'm glad that you put it into written words and not just verbal words uh, spoken, which you get to do today. I'm wondering, and for you listening, the book is called The Origins of You, How Breaking Family Patterns Can Liberate the Way We Live and Love. When I, One thing that I've noticed, not just in, I would say, my family system, but just in general in, in human <laughs> systems, seems to be a common lack of skill. And, and maybe I'm using the wrong word, so please correct me. But it's that 
it seems to be hard to hold disappointment and also there's like a fear that I've noticed in previous interactions with people that I love that that if I'm disappointed or they're disappointed that there's not still love present and and of course that can be redefined and re changed but why is criticism or feedback or even just exploring truths that have not been excavated somehow what is the right word uh, coupled with with a lack of love like to me that's so strange now to to explore from being able to do that but previously being like stop talking stop telling me what i need to do better you know yeah well those people i think probably have some form of a worthiness wound meaning that when I disappoint you, I'm no longer worthy of your love, connection, presence, whatever, right? And so when we start to give feedback to people who have this worthiness wound, which can originate from being a people pleaser, growing up in a family system where you needed to please, going, growing up in a family system where you needed to perform um, in order to get love or attention, um, growing up in a family system where there was any type of conditional aspects to, you know, get great grades, be a phenomenal athlete, um, be quieter at home. When you do these things, then love, connection, attention, validation are present for you. When you don't do those things, then it's gone. So a lot of times we operate in a system like that. And then we grow up to be adults who are so afraid of disappointing someone, letting somebody down. It's the thing that drags our worth with us, right? So, you know, for you, as you describe, like, you know, the people you love who you, you want to give feedback to, right? Where you're like, Hey, I'm hurt by X or I'm disappointed in Y and I still love you. Yeah. I'm still connected to you. I'm not going anywhere. Right. That's, that is a really hard thing for people to navigate. I know this one. Well, um, my dad was someone who would, use conditional love really as, um, as punishment. He would give me the silent treatment. Um, if I behaved in a certain way that he didn't like, if I behaved in the way he did like, he was really connected, loving, super helpful. He would do things for me. Um, lots of acts of service, but the moment that I was not who he wanted me to be, the moment he didn't like how I was operating, is when he would withhold himself. And he did it by using silent treatment days at a time, sometimes weeks at a time. And I learned that when I'm easygoing, right, then love, connection, help, support was available to me. When I'm more difficult, then that's not available to me. And I think it's interesting, you know, coupled with the story that I shared earlier, it goes so hand in hand with this needless little girl, this needless woman who's totally fine, the easygoing, cool girl persona, unaffected by everything, who also is presenting in the way that other people want me to so that I can maintain connection, closeness, love, intimacy, all really the illusion of it. But that was far safer to operate that way than some other way. And again, right, sort of the moment that I started to see how that type of withholding of love and connection and support and help was playing out. Um, there was a big shift that took place there, right? It's like, I, you know, of course I don't intend to be difficult, <laughs> um, but you know, that, that there is space. I remember the first time with Connor, my husband, we were in some type of conflict. I have no idea what we were fighting about. And you know, when you have that outer body experience, when you start, like you hear yourself just keep going and going and you're kind of like, stop, shut up, <laughs> yeah. stop speaking. Don't like, you're not please helping. cut it out. You're not helping, but you can't, you double down, you triple down, you keep going, you keep proving your point. Point, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember getting to the point where it sort of like for me, it just crashed in. And I remember Connor holding this beautiful space for me. And it was in this moment where I was like, oh my gosh, I have been really, really difficult in this moment. But everything I'm feeling from this other person is that he's still here. He still loves me. He still somehow wants to be with me. This was early on in our relationship. And it was such a moment for me 
because I, I, it was exactly what you're talking about. It's like, I'm a little bit different, right? Like to disappoint and to love and, and to still love for me, it was like to be kind of disappointing mm. and difficult and to still be loved. Same. Right. And this was really tied to my worthiness wound that had originated in my childhood and had per- really persisted throughout. And I was really coming into contact with, wow, like this is how I'm acting these things out. This is how I'm pushing boundaries. This is, you know, is there a part of me that is is trying to prove that story true, right? That like when you are difficult, see everybody does leave, see everybody does shut down, see everybody does give you the silent treatment. And, you know, again, kind of coming back into that, why do I do this work? It's like, because it all ties, because it all (laughs) connects. And when we can start to heal the origin pain, then we can start to make the shifts in our adult lives. You know, this worthiness is the first wound that I talk about in the second section of the book. So when you're asking like, why can't people, why is it so hard for people to hold that paradox, right? To sort of exist in, I, you did something that was disappointing and you are still worthy, lovable, et cetera. It's that it comes back into these origin wounds that we haven't resolved, right? That are still, that we're still at odds with. I can't hear feedback without my entire worthiness identity getting blown up, right? I can't hold this space that I can still be loved or chosen or important or worthy or deserving when I'm hearing things like this because in the past, I learned that I wasn't. In the past, I had dad who shut down or mom who was critical or a sibling who, you know, it's like, there's so many things that have taught us to believe this. And if we don't go into that origin pain, it persists and it makes us and keeps us as adults who can't have these conversations, who can't receive feedback, who can't operate in this space without the pain, you know, taking over. One of the greatest green flags in relationship is if someone has really nice sheets. Right, like we all value sleep, of course, and we value feeling comfortable when we're in bed and that's imperative. And Cozy Earth Sheets are my favorite sheets ever. I've loved this product for, since I discovered them, which is about five years ago. They've been on Oprah's favorites list for four years in a row. Cozy Earth Sheets are softer than cotton. They're incredible. They're temperature regulating, so that means they keep you cool and comfortable all night long. And they believe in their product so much that they have a 10 year warranty on all of them and they have a hundred night sleep test. So that means that if you're like, yeah, I want to try these sheets. I want to see if these sheets really live up to the joy and excitement Mark has for them. They do. You get a hundred night sleep test. So you get to try for a hundred nights. If you don't love them, you can send them back for a full refund. Because Cozy Earth loves that I love these sheets and they want you to experience them. I've just hooked you up with a 40% off site wide discount. All you got to use is the code GROVES at checkout. So just my last name at checkout. You get 40% off all their stuff. Go get these sheets. They're incredible. Go to CozyEarth.com and use the code GROVES at checkout for 40% off. We need to talk about my morning routine. I'm nailing it. I got meditation, breath work, some cool plunging, workouts. And, you know, most of you have probably tried meditation. I'm guessing for some of you, it is part of your morning ritual. But have you tried breath work? That's my question. I took a class on an app that I'm just loving and I'm hooked on it. The app is unbelievable and it's called Open. I had the founder, Minaj Diaz, on the podcast a few times because he's an incredible teacher and he really lives everything that he shares. And the app is incredible. The design is insane. Some of the benefits that I've really experienced from implementing this in my morning routine is I sleep better, I'm less stressed, and I have more energy and focus throughout the day. And the best part about Open is that the classes are under 10 minutes. So it's easy to stick with. It's not like an overwhelming thing. It's actually quite simple. And so usually what I'll do is a meditation, breath work, and then they also have movement classes. So it's easy to just have consistent morning routines because you can go to one place and it's just that much easier. It's definitely different from other mindfulness apps out there and you're definitely gonna know what I mean when you try it. You get 30 days for free when you sign up with my code, Create the Love. 
So you just visit withopen.com slash create the love. So again, you get 30 days free, so you got no risk on open, and you just go to withopen, W-I-T-H-O-P-E-N.com slash create the love. Go check it out. Yeah, now that I think about the worthiness wound, I think because I have mostly, I don't ever want to say heal because then the universe is going to give me a nice slap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I feel like because through relationships like relationships with you, Connor, friendships, Kai, I've been able to be disappointing and still have someone sit and love me. And then I think now bringing that understanding and space to relationships that were not structured on that, I see, you know, that there is, is, and, and I know you talk about this, that that when you shake the system, like when you become different, then but you're you're bringing this healing in this space back to the family systems along that line of inquiry and thought. What are you know other than worthiness? Uh, what other uh, beautiful wounds do we carry that, <laughs> that that show up? And, and what do they look like? Like as children and then adults, what might it translate as? Sure. Yeah. So I cover five origin wounds, and when I sat down to really think about all of the wounds that I could list and name really felt like at the end of the day, they really would wind up underneath these umbrellas. People might use different language for it. How we internalize experiences can present in different types of wounds. So really, really quickly, the five that I cover are worthiness, belonging, prioritization, safety, and trust. But I want to give a really quick example here, um, how an event can take place and be internalized in a mul multitude of different ways. So for example, you have a, a parent who abandons you as a child. That could result in a worthiness wound, believing that I must not be good enough of a child, of a person for this par parent to stick around. It could result in a trust wound, mm -hmm. meaning I don't trust the closest people in my life, let alone anyone, because the people who are meant to be consistent and predictable and protect me and not harm me was the person who wound up doing that to me in the first place. It could present as a prioritization wound, right? It's like you prioritized your own self over me, right? And now I can't feel or I struggle to feel like a priority in the world. So I wanted to just give sort of an example like that because there's no, you're not fitting into boxes. There's no sort of like black or white here. This is very much about understanding and naming, you know, what those experiences are that left a wound, that left pain for you. And then really seeing how it gets internalized and manifests into, you know, one of these wounds. So yeah, we won't get too caught up in the language. If there's a different word that works for you better, great. Um, so, okay, we've already talked about the worthiness wound. Um, and I guess I gave some examples about like well, we've we've used ourselves for <laughs> we've used we've ourselves for the ourselves worthiness one. We have yes. so belonging, right? This idea of being a part of something. Um, I know that you have interviewed Dr. Gabor Mate uh, already on the show, and so you and some of your listeners are probably really familiar with the idea. He talks about this idea for children, the lifelines of being authenticity and attachment. But when we have to choose one, when we must pick one, we will choose attachment every single time. Right? That's our lifeline for emotional, physical, et cetera, needs being met. We need it to literally survive. And so when we need to prioritize that for ourselves, we lose our relationship to authenticity, right? In order to belong here, right? To, in order to belong in this family system, this is who I need to be. So many people go through those experiences and become a little bit more this if I'm a little bit less that, right? It's like that's how we operate in this family or this is how we get the love and the attachment or the connection that we want. Um, there's a lot of adaptation that happens at first with the belonging wound because as kids, all we want to do is fit in. Yeah. That's it, right? Like no matter what, we just want to fit in. Fitting in is very different than belonging, but 
in the early stages, of course, right? As kiddos, we just want to fit in. We want to feel a part of something. And we'll, we can, you, you can see how that can show up in endless ways. Yeah. So we do this path of adaptation for so long, right? Who do I need to be? Who do I need to become to be a part of this? And again, you know, I say in the book how, you know, our parents, our family systems, the adults in our lives, they teach us what to believe. We don't have a say in that in the beginning, right? This is what it means this is what it means to be a part of the family this is what this family believes mm-hmm. this is how this family operates in the world right and sometimes that's super explicit right you might have even me saying that for some people they're like yeah literally <laughs> like they said those words yeah. right like this is it and some of that is beautiful right some of it's like so fun tuesday taco night whatever like this is <laughs> these are our traditions totally. these are the holidays these are the things that we do that are incredible but other things are not, you know, other things are really against what, who we are at our core, right? Back to that authenticity piece. You can't accept me for who I am. You don't know how to be with me for who I am, whether that means that I have a different belief than you, whether who I am doesn't fit into the religion that you practice, Right. So there's so many different examples of what that, what that is. And, you know, again, how that can come along with us into adulthood is that either we continue to adapt constantly to who do I need to be? What do I need to say? What do I need to pretend to believe in order to fit in? and quote unquote belong. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes there's a rejection, right? So we can um, kind of swing to the opposite side of things. And maybe we get to a place where we're so sick and tired of not fitting in that we kind of just throw everything to the wind. Um, But to actually move to a place of authenticity, to come back into a place of authenticity is going to take a lot of time tending to, you know, the origin pain that put these wounds there in the first place. Right. And so, yeah, adaptation and, you know, rejection of, you know, how sometimes people are like, you know, you grow up in a family system where you have to wear, you know, certain clothes because this is, we're prim and proper. This is how yeah. we present to the world. And then at a certain point you're like, I'm going to wear everything possible. <laughs> so, that's going to embarrass you. Yeah. You know, it's like, right. It's like this total opposition to, and really the rejection of it, but that is not authenticity either. Uh, that's interesting. It's rebellious. I see what you're saying. It's rebellious. Yeah, it's rebellion instead. Okay, the third is prioritization. So I want to feel like I am important, right? I want to be a priority in your life. And, you know, there's many ways that this can can show up in childhood. A, a parent, step-parent, adult who prioritizes work over the child. Um, addiction that takes over. Mental health challenges that take over. A sibling's illness that takes over. Right? There can be, again, like we were saying before, sometimes it's negligent things or you know, sometimes it's things that a parent might be operating more from a selfish place for. And then other times it's like life happened, right. you know, like my sibling got cancer and the whole family had to focus on that, but I was no longer a priority in that system. Right. There's the, so many things that can take place in our lives and childhood that really have no bad intention behind them to deprioritize us, but still do. I talk about a client in the book where for the first, you know, seven, eight years of her life, she's the youngest child of the in the family. She was the focal point. She was the baby. Everybody put all the attention on her. My siblings loved say that. her. You know me. Okay, about you. All right. Well, you might be able to to identify with this. But at at a certain point, her mom, uh, her mom's sister had died, and the mom became very depressed, and the 
tune shifted in really dramatic ways where she was no longer the priority. The depression was right. The mental health challenge was, and dad would encourage her to help cheer mom up and, you know, go in there and make her feel better. The other siblings were older. And so there was just a time where, you know, there was such a dramatic shift from having been a priority to no longer being a priority, even though she understood the story, right. Even though she understood why it happened. And it's interesting, you know, fast forward, she presents with her partner in therapy. Um, they had both moved from Spain for graduate school in New York. And they were on this, they were best friends before they were on this wild adventure together. Um, and she felt like a priority to her, her partner, uh, Josefina. But at some point during their time in New York, uh, Joe started to prioritize more autonomous things, doing things on her own, spending, making new friends that were only her friends. She wasn't sharing in everything with, uh, Isabel, who's the, um, the woman I was talking about before all of these names are changed, just FYI. Uh, so everybody's confidential here, but the whole point being that what was activating for her in adulthood was that she did not feel like a priority to her partner. Her partner was starting to prior prioritize other things. And what was so interesting about this case was it, sort of really the parallel of this was that she had been a prior priority to Joe at one point in their relationship. And then something shifted in the same way that it had in her childhood. And, you know, context is not meant to give excuses, um, but it does offer us insight that really helps in this process. And, it was very helpful for her to see and understand that part of what was activating so much of her reactivity here, because she was trying to control her partner, um, it, it like almost forcing her to prioritize yeah. her, uh, was to see that there was an origin wound that had never been spoken about, that had really never been tended to, that had never been grieved. And she kept trying to force prioritization by giving... Joe ultimatums and, you know, telling her she needed to. And sometimes she would, you know, she threw everything up against the wall to see what would stick and nothing would stick because it wasn't coming from a place that it needed to come. And when we started to do the origin healing work together, that all began to shift. And so you can see, you know, again, that one is a pretty parallel process of like, oh, it doesn't take so so much to connect the dots. Sometimes our pain from the past comes along in really clear and obvious ways. And sometimes it comes along in really subtle ways. But a prioritization wound is going to have you trying to be a priority in you know, someone's life, someone you care about deeply. And if you don't tend to it, you're going to go about that in ways that are usually controlling or, you know, offering ultimatums or threatening ending a relationship, right? There's so many ways that it can, it, that it can play out. So yeah, we want to go back again into that origin wound in order to properly tend to it. So it doesn't have to have such a tight grip on us in adult life. In that one, when we haven't, like, it sounds to me like, as you were saying, trying to control the current circumstances and those skills that she's using, obviously not productive, uh, but is it also because the fear of actually sitting with the unconsciously, the lack of prioritization means, as you were saying, that she then would have to grieve something that she hasn't even given herself permission or even awareness to. So like, it's crazy these adaptive relational strategies that are about protecting us from touching something that we don't even know exists. Like when she did the work, was she just like the same thing, I guess, as the conversation you're having about your previous relationship where it's like, ding, and she's like, shit. <laughs> like, Yeah, that's it, right? Ding. I, I mean, this is what generally happens when we do origin healing work because there are so many dings, <laughs> yeah. so many so aha true. moments where you're like, Oh my gosh, yeah. because here's what, what happens. People want to come in and they want to say, we're in conflict. You're not prioritizing me, right? And we need to figure this out. 
And we can sit here and we can have as many conversations as you want about trying to, okay, how quickly do we want to respond to a text? How do we let we know let each other know that you care about each other? How do you show your partner that you do actually prioritize them? How do you honor your partner's desire for autonomy, right? Of course, if you want to sit here and have that conversation, we can. But what always happens is that, okay, that puts a little Band-Aid over it for, I don't know, couple hours yeah. to a couple of days, maybe maybe a week if you're really lucky. <laughs> and then you're back in the office talking about the same conflict that keeps on showing up. And that's what unresolved origin pain will do. I say at some point in my book, I say, our wounds are not out to harm us. Right? Our wounds are out to be healed. They're going to tug at us. They want our attention because the pain from the past wants to be resolved. But if we don't resolve it, it's going to keep finding ways it's to poke its little head up. It is brilliant. Yeah, sneaky. At, but it will mess with you. It'll, it'll, thr- it'll crash and burn the stuff around you if you don't tend to it. And so, yeah, this was a, a big aha. And again, beautifully said, of course, right, that like sometimes it's in the simplest of ahas that are just so, so deeply profound for us where it's like, wow, right, that's why I've been doing this. And of course, later in the book, we talk about uh, Joseph Josephina's uh, origin wounds and how those two come together. Because they always go hard. together so perfectly. They always do. It's so like two pieces of a beautiful puzzle. It is. It's like, yeah. I mean, right, there's like, there are offerings there for always. each other. We always, I love what you said, though, that we like want to bring our partner in who's like not seeing that we're not being prioritized so that the therapist will also be like, hey, you're not prioritizing this person. And then we're all of a sudden unpacking our own shit and we're like, fuck, you know, like, <laughs> I thought they're stunk. I was, all I wanted was more yeah. love and presence. You know, is right. I uh, have just been witnessing the healing of an aspect of martyrdom in my own psyche, spirit, whatever. And I looked up the uh, etymology of the word martyr and it is witness, to be witnessed. And I thought, oh man, isn't that so beautiful that when we witness these things, which present as like the victim or the martyr and and not shaming when, when the origin is actually something or the experience is victimization, but it was just so powerful to have that experience of, and I, I just think of Isabel witnessing that, and then now being liberated from the grief, the avoidance of grief. In my, maybe we'll get to this in this call, but part of my origin healing practice uh, requires witnessing. You know, that's the second, that's, that's part right. two of the practice. And thanks for setting me up for that for that dunk. No problemo. I didn't even mean to. Yeah, let's. we still got four and five, and then we'll get right into the dunking. We got four and five. So four is um, safety. You know, safety is, mm, we've, we have to be so, so careful with this one. You know, in this chapter, and I remind people of it, of course, right, is that in order to talk about a safety wound, we uh, must talk about abuse. And, you know, unfortunately, many of us experienced or witnessed abuse in our family systems, um, anywhere from physical to sexual to emotional to psychological. Yeah, there's a lot that goes on there. So, you know, I very carefully walk us through this, but it's a, you know, it's a heavy one. And yet at the other side of that, right, what, what it leaves us with is the belief that our well-being is not safe in this space, right? That we're not taking care of here, whether it's physical, sexual, emotional, spiritual, um, and on. And yeah, you know, of course we know that if we experience any type of abuse, that sets the tone for a lot of things, you know? And it's interesting how sometimes these wounds can really be woven in together, uh, into one another, uh, right? Of like, how do you trust someone in the world, right? If you've experienced a safety wound, for example, even though trust is its own uh, separate wound, right? So you can sort of see how they overlap and interconnect. Am I worthy of love if this is how you treated me, right? What is this, you know, what does this do, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many ways in which a safety origin wound can can be birthed. I talk about, uh, there. there's many examples that I give in the book, but one of them is about this guy who is 
you know, he, he makes really good money, um, but he's very reckless with his money. He spends it all, has no savings, uh, and it just kind of pushes it all away. And he comes in, he's like, I don't know why I'm so reckless with my money. I, I want to understand this better. And we learn, of course, I'm like, all right, well, let's talk about your family system. He's like, <laughs> why can't we just talk about me having better spending Can habits with my money? Can we just talk about my bank accounts? I don't. <laughs> right. Yeah. Can we just talk about a bank account? <laughs> but we, we venture back into uh, his family of origin and learn that uh, his father, when his father would drive with him, he would go 85, 90 miles per hour in like a 35. Wow. Um, I know you go by kilometers, so that's you'll have like to find 140 a, in a 60. You know, as a, as a kid, right? He's like, no matter how much he would beg, scream, plead, please, please, please slow down, dad, please, right? His dad never would do it. And he was always left with like, why does my life not matter to you? You know, he was always angry about something with his mom, uh, sorry, with the dad's uh, wife, the, the client's mom, and was just reckless with him. And we saw that this recklessness had come along with him. And this was one of the ways where he continued to act it out himself. He was being reckless with his life in a very different way than the way his father had been reckless with his life decades earlier. And he was behaving in a way where he wasn't creating, in this case, you know, financial safety for himself right? As a little kid, he felt physically unsafe, right? He thought his dad was going to crash into something that they'd both die. Um, and then as an adult, he was behaving in a way that really uh, challenged financial safety for himself. And when we started to really tend to that origin wound, right, that's the thing that opened up the capacity for him to actually make changes in his life. And you think, you know, we were joking about it just before. Had we sat there and like tried to come up with a plan for, you know, you should save 25% of your paycheck and put that straight into a savings. And then you should put another 25% here. Like that conversation is not the conversation we need to have. Can he follow through on that for a little while? Again, maybe, but does that tend to the unresolved pain? Right. No, no. And will that be something that he's able to maintain through and through, through and through? Likely not, right? Likely not. Right, because it's the way that his unresolved pain is trying to get his attention. Mm, interesting. Our systems are brilliant, brilliant systems. They are so fascinating, the ways that they will peek out and grab our attention. And if we're willing to look, you know, that's the beauty of it, is that if we're willing to look, and I always say this, this the book is not designed, we're not going backwards to hang out there forever. We're just taking a look back to see what it is that needs to be seen so that we can move forward. Um, so that's one example uh, in, in the safety chapter. The last uh, origin wound is the trust wound. This is where we experience betrayal. Woof. Betrayal can wipe us out and Oof. sets the road for, you know, can we trust anybody else? Uh, and, and just the doubt. So it can be betrayal. It can be deceit. It can be lies. Um, yeah, there's so much that can happen there. One example that I give, uh, I actually open with her uh, in the book, my story first, but then I open with her. She's coming to therapy present day because she's with a partner, Clyde. We lo Everybody loves Clyde in the book. Uh, and <laughs> Clyde is this great guy. She really has nothing bad to say about him. And she's trying to figure out if she's going to be able to move forward with him into engagement or whether she's got to end it. She's afraid that the other shoe is going to drop. Mm -hmm. That's what she keeps saying, but she doesn't understand because he's amazing, has everything going for him. There really are no problems. We start, of course, same thing as the other guy looking backwards. And she's like, I have a great childhood. I don't think we're going to find anything there. I'd really like to focus on this decision. <laughs> Takes some time to get there, but eventually something opens up. And for the first time ever in her life, she shares with me that as a teenager, one day she came across an email between her father and a woman who wasn't her mother. 
And it was revealing all of the details of their affair, how much they loved each other, et cetera, et cetera. She came across this as a teenager. He walks in on her. He tells her, please do not tell your mother. I promise I'll stop it. They have this sort of spoken, explicit contract. She never shares this. It's not until she shares it with me that those words have ever come out of her mouth. Wow. And she finally connects that this idea that the other shoe is going to drop with Clyde is connected to the fact that her image of her father and her entire family got shattered in this moment. She had always held her father on a pedestal in such high regard. He was someone who always came home on time, was always there for dinner, apparently seemed to love everybody in the family. They really had a beautiful family system, but she knew what had happened. She had to hold that secret from her mom, her sister. She really had absorbed it so much so, right? That like she didn't even realize that this was still running the show. And the way that it did previously to Clyde too, was that she'd end relationships prematurely. She don't, she wanted to protect herself from this impending betrayal that she always believed was going to happen, even though there was absolutely zero evidence of that coming in from anyone else. And so when we started to work with that origin pain, right, then she was actually able to give Clyde more context. They were able to find a way forward together where she didn't need to keep protecting herself by ending relationships. And so that's another example of how that can manifest um, when you have an origin trust wound. I use stories in this book, um, my own, but also many, many, many of my clients. And I do that because I think stories help us see ourselves yeah, somewhere agreed. or at the very minimum, they help us see a partner there or a child there or a parent there. And I love teaching through stories because, you know, as we were saying before, sometimes it can feel really scary to look at our own selves first. And so might you look at somebody else's story and find yourself in that story to begin to do this work and see where some of the pain is being held. And so I love the stories in this book and how compelling they are and what a gift all of these people uh, offer every single one of us to be able to relate to these wounds maybe slightly a little bit more easily. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think the power of story too, as you're saying, is that you know, even if we're not Isabella and Josephine, we're heterosexual, you can still always find patterns in all the things. That's a, The story could have nothing to do with your circumstance, but you're like, oh my gosh, uh, boom, I do that. I found that with your stories too and, and just with the way you teach in general. I'm curious with... So if we're identifying our wounds, you said the next one is witness. Can you walk us through that process? And then how do we just solve it, heal it at all? <laughs> Give me the the quick one, two, three, and let's be done with it. Uh, this is forever work, which is so beautiful. The good news is that you don't have to figure this out overnight. Um, there's a quote towards the end of the book because I'm trying to slow us down and not set such high expectations for ourselves. Uh, I forget the years and the days. I'd have to look it up in the book. Um, but uh, the Argentinian footballer, uh, Messi, who probably most people know at this point, given the World Cup, um, he says something like, it only took me 17 years and 143 days to become an overnight success, you know, and I, I got the years and days wrong, probably. I don't remember it exactly, but that's the point of this work is that you, we don't, we're not overnight successes. This is this is a forever process that we keep coming back in contact with over and over and over again. Because as we move through life, new things will present to us and they will point us back to something that is either new or old, but needs, needs our tending. So the first step, yeah, to name it, to identify what the wound actually is. Um, so hopefully in those chapters, the wound chapters, you're going to be able to really connect to which ones show up for you. Uh, it is likely that you have more than one. I've had a few people who've had early copies of the book who are like, is it possible to have all five? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it is. Yeah. Um, and you might be surprised by some of the ones that you're like, ooh, this does kind of feel like something here. Um, the second part is the witnessing of the pain. Uh, we do need a witness. And of course, witness self of self 
beautiful. We want that to be a part of it. At some point, also having another trusted person be a witness is an incredibly profound experience. What we are witnessing is the loss. It's the pain. Um, We are acknowledging it, right? We're acknowledging what was lost um, way back when. We are acknowledging the loss of the self, too, right? That that happened long ago. And so we're, you know, I walk us through, if you're reading the book, I've always found this so interesting with books when you're actually reading print where it's like, okay, often in, in self-help books, you know, like, okay, sit down, close your eyes. And you're like, okay, but how do you want me to keep reading that? <laughs> so if you are doing the print version, but you also are working through the origin healing practice, uh, I convince them to let me put the audio of the origin healing practice on my site so that even if you did not get the audio book, oh, so but good. you want to be walked through this process, you can actually close your eyes and get comfortable um, and let yourself really drop into it. It's really hard to go back and forth. Like, okay, I'm going to witness the younger I version of that myself. Okay, let me do that. You know, and then, okay, now I'm going to do this. It's, it's too disjointed. Um, the third part is grieving. Whew. Even just saying it. You know, it's like, it's just, it's a load, you know, and I remember when I was doing this work, one of the images that I would bring into focus for myself was always, I was usually, I think I was about seven or eight and I would bring into focus my seven or eight year old self perched atop the stairs at my mom's house. There were two flights. And in the middle, there was sort of this open window uh, with just wooden uh, like bar slats across it. So I could always listen in to the conversation she was having on the phone with my dad. And I was perched atop the stairs. And I remember just sitting there and there were other times where I'd pick up the second phone in either one of their homes and listen into the conversations. Yeah. And, and so in the witnessing, right, I would just bring my attention back to seeing that little girl in that moment by herself, taking in a lot of information, uh, absorbing a lot, trying to process a lot all by herself and just noticing her, acknowledging her, how hard that was, um, how much emotion was there, letting her know that she didn't need to do that you know, like that, that wasn't what she should have been doing at the time, not from a critical place from, right. From a heartfelt, like, yeah, I'm so sorry that this is what you had to hold. And, you know, the grieving part, the witnessing and grieving really, you know, they're, they're separate pieces to the, to the practice, but they are, they really do go hand in hand because the moment you start to witness, right? Like the grief really it starts does, yeah. to show up if you'll allow it and to let yourself feel, to let yourself cry, to let yourself just be in the noticing and the experiencing of it. And, you know, we, we do this in the privacy of our homes. We do it where we feel the most safe. But this is a part of the practice because the more that we tend to that, the more that the wound can start to heal, be a little bit more resolved. And it doesn't mean that it's oh, done. Did I, I did the practice and now I'm done, right? It's like, no, grief will present as many times as it needs to, yeah. right? As, as many times reminder. as the thing comes in contact with that. Um, but beautiful that when we start to do that, it leads us into the fourth step, which is the pivot, um, which is what I talked about at the beginning of uh, the, the show today, which is, you know, jumping off the tracks into the fresh powder, into trying something new, taking an eyes wide wide open risk of doing it a little bit differently and operating with your wounds, not in the driver's seat, but your healing in the driver's seat. Always easier said than done. It is a practice. Sometimes we need to try it 50,000 times before (laughs) we get it. That's okay. But you know, through repetition, 
right? There's going to be some movement there. And I'm so excited for people to walk themselves through the practice as many times as we need to, to go at a pace that feels okay for folks. Um, with the safety wound, I walk people through um, a safety meditation as opposed to, you know, the origin healing practice is always there, but I always recommend for people to really be mindful and thoughtful of their experience. If you have trauma, if you have complex trauma, to maybe work alongside of a therapist as you move through some of the stuff that you find in the book. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm so excited for people to connect with their origin pain and to start on the path of resolution. Yeah. I mean, the, the access to it through your book makes it so, I mean, we can do it in, in a nice Sunday afternoon. And begin to have the ding, ding, dings going on, you know, because they're not, they're, they seem endless, you know, and I love that process too. The first one is name, witness, grieve, and then pivot. Yeah. And, and you can't leave any of those processes unpivoted or else you stay in the pattern. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. You can't just jump to pivoting. That's what people try to do when they totally. come to therapy, totally, right? Totally, they're like, yeah. I want to solve, right? Like we want to just pivot, pivot. And it's like, yeah, this is the right. Um, we want to just pivot what's happening right now. And great, try. But if it's not working, please come into this work. You know, like if you want to try to pivot, go for it. Right? If you can make like a quick behavioral change, amazing. Right? Beautiful. But if you can't, if you find that pattern repeating again, if that conflict is happening again, if you're reactive again, right? If you're blowing things out of proportion again, if you can give advice to your friends that you can't take again, <laughs> then you might want to begin exploring, exploring your origin pain. Yeah. I heard Francis Weller recently, I was listening to something of his and he said, you can't change what you have not yet made sacred. And I, you know, the process that you're sharing, I just think, you know, the, the brilliance in the pivot is in the witnessing and the grieving. Like how else do you garner the brilliance of the child or the moment. I think that that's what the, the, why that quote from Messi is really so profound, right? Is that the pivot of becoming this like sensation is like, no, no, no. That's because I came early and I left late. It's because I practice time and time again. I practice more than anybody else ever practices, right? It's because I did do the identifying, the witnessing, the grieving, right? In order to actually get to the pivot, right? And that's, yeah, it takes some time. But when we dedicate, you know, our energy, we, and listen, we can dip in and out of it. And sometimes we need to take a pause and a break from it all. But there's um, something very sacred and profound about this work. And there's a lot that goes into it. There is. Well, thank you for uh, bringing this sacred work to a book and to your work in general, but now to written ability to just take all the things you talk about in all these different places and shoop right into one spot. So where can people find more of you? Where can they get the book? Cause I know you got some juicy things to go with it. Oh, uh. Yeah, I'm I'm so excited to hear how people feel about this book. You can get this book anywhere that books are sold. Um, so whatever place you enjoy buying books from, go that path, go that path. Um, it is available, I think, now. I can pre-order it currently and it will be well, available. Well, you can pre-order it now, but it comes, it publishes on February 21st. Um, and yeah, you can find me on Instagram at mindful MFT as in marriage family therapy. Viennaferrin.com is where the audio of the origin healing practices uh, will be for those of you who are reading the print, not doing the audiobook of it. I do read my audiobook, which I highly recommend too. Uh, but if you like reading and flipping those pages, but want to be held through the practice, yeah, you can find those on my site. And if you don't know how to spell my name, I bet it'll be in the, the, the it'll notes be in on everything. Your... <laughs> we will not spell it wrong in yes. the title. And we'll make sure we put all the links in the show notes. So you, if you're listening, you can just go straight to that. There is also a limited offer of a book club that you can do where Vienna teaches alongside yeah. as you go through the book. So we'll make sure we link that out too. That's going to be fun. I'm, that's the only book club I'm doing. You're like, I'm with you for six weeks. Powerful. It's going to be 
it's going to be good. So yeah, I hope people will join for that. Oh man, if you're, th- if you want to get into this stuff, do it with the author alongside you. And yeah, so we'll put all the links in there. Vienna, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your brilliance. Thank you. Thank you.